Hello, class, and welcome to Music 133 Summer Session. Um, now, uh, summer session, not much different than uh, a regular session, but in the summer, it's a little more compressed, a um, little tighter schedule. Um, but regardless, um, you know, uh, my, I want you to remember that as, as your instructor for this course, I am here, I'm a resource, I want you to reach out to me. So who am I? <laughs> I am Dr. Wilcox, um, and I am a composer. Uh, I write music, and I'm also uh, an instructional designer. That means I help make online courses, uh, not just for Rutgers, but also uh, for the University of California. So I am both an online uh, pedagogy person and, uh, and an, uh, a musician. My PhD is in music composition. So uh, this course is an introductory course to music theory. And I wanted to say a few words about what music theory is. And in some ways, the easiest way to do that is with an analogy. So music theory is like learning, is like a language, right? So when you learn, uh, learned uh, to read and write in your native language. When I learned to read and write uh, in, you know, first, second, third grade, when I learned to read and write English, I learned two skills. I learned to read English out loud. So if I had it in front of me and I did very poorly, but I would, you know, read, read aloud to the class. I learned to read it and I learned to write it. I learned what what the punctuation did and the tenses and, you know, matching, you know, verb type with subject and noun and all that. And, you know, you, you make all those graphs for grammar and make sure you know all the parts of speech. I learned those two elements here. Um, and so in some way, music is, is a language. It has its own syntax. It has its own conventions. It has its own way of writing things down and uh, reading things. Um, and it is very possible, in case you didn't realize, to, to learn to uh, read a language without being able to write it. I've learned how to read Spanish to pass an exam, but I, but I couldn't write it at all. I was, I was completely incapable of that. Um, and I bring that up for a particular reason. Um, in the past, I've done some surveys and I know that about 85% of the students who take this course, let me just adjust that a little bit, 85% of the students who take this course have had some sort of musical training, whether that's a couple of years of flute when they were in elementary school or you know, 12 years of piano or you know, whatever, your parents made you play violin in high school. Um, they've had some degree of musical training and they take this course thinking, well, I need to get an arts requirement out of the way. I've already had, you know, a lot of music practice. I'm set. It's going to be easy. Um, but what they've learned to do in performing and playing an instrument, which is very valuable, is they've learned to essentially read music. But they haven't learned to write music. So a lot of the conventions, the spelling of chords or the writing of scales, a lot of the things that they've learned, um, they ha have not included the component of, of uh, writing. They can, they can read music, but they haven't learned to write music. And the big advantage, if you've, if you've never had any musical training, um, this course is, is designed with that in mind that you will not necessarily have had any musical training, but the big advantage of the big advantage of having had um, musical training is that you've really learned your notes, right? You, you can, you see a note, you know what note it is instantly. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to, when you're, when you're learning to write notes or when you're learning to uh, take notes and, you know, make chords and, and things like that. It's a lot easier when you, when these little components, it's like learning your letters. When you have your letters memorized, it's a lot easier to start writing words if you have to, you know, like learn Greek or something where it's a different set of letters, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have a harder time because you're learning the letters and you're learning to write the words. So with music, um, you know, 
uh, if, if you've had training in performance in, in reading music, you'll, you'll know the letters, but that won't necessarily mean that you're an expert in writing music. And this is a course about writing music. And the good thing for those of you who've had no musical training is that the only real advantage between people with musical training, and this is generally speaking, and people without musical training is the ability to read those notes. And you can learn to read notes in the most important clefs, uh, which will be treble and bass clef, which we'll look, look at a little uh, today. Um, the, most, the, the, mo the biggest difference between people with training and, out, and not training um, is essentially their ability to read notes consistently and quickly. So if you can use some flashcards and I'll put some links up to some, some tools that allow you to, um, to do some practice, uh, learning to read and write notes. If you do that, you'll be in good shape. Um, so all of that being said, essentially the message is um, this course can be taken by anybody. Um, if you have musical training, uh, you shouldn't assume that what you learned when you learned to, you know, play the flute or the trumpet, you know, you shouldn't assume that you're going to have mastered all the content of the course. This is a course in writing music, not, not performing music. So there's going to be things that you've missed, um, little, little holes in your knowledge all over the place that we're going to try to fill in here. And if you haven't had any experience performing, that's not a problem because we're going to be learning to write music and we're going to start right at the beginning. So relax, breathe. I need to breathe. <laughs> and uh, let's, let's step into some of the things about unit one. Now, some things I want to point out just generally about the course, now that we've kind of talked about the, those issues. Um, first of all, this is, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, on on YouTube here, and I'm I'm broadcasting right into the forum. So if you want to ask me a question in the follow up discussions right below this video, right below this post, ask a question. And if you're not able to make this recording, you can watch it later. It'll be put right there in the forum, and you can continue to ask questions. You can continue to, um, you know, probe me for details about, you know ascending leaps, if, if that's an important topic for you. So go ahead and ask whatever questions you want, and I'll go ahead and I'll answer them uh, as they come up in the forum. Um, and beyond that, I'll talk about some of the other aspects of the course. Um, there are two major types of assignments. That's where people want to spend most of their time. There's homework assignments, and then there's creative projects. Uh, and the exam, and I kind of lump those together. The nice thing about the homework assignments is that you can take those homework assignments over and over again until you get the score that you'd like. Um, the bad thing about homework assignments is that you can take them over and over and over again until you get the score that you like. Um, and the reason I say that's a bad thing is there's really, really large question banks for these homework assignments. Um, sometimes literally every possible, like for the note, note identification ones, every possible note that you could possibly be asked on a piano keyboard um, will be asked. You, you could get any of them. So redoing the homework assignment means that you're actually redoing the homework assignment. It's giving you a whole new set of questions. So it is in your interest not to beat your head against homework assignments to get one or two more points. Um, it's, if you're having trouble, it's in your interest to go back and, and do some more preparation, more studying before you continually redo assignments. But you can redo them. And even after a unit has closed, you can still redo um, homework assignments. Now that's different than the creative projects and it's different than the exam. Those are have a fixed time frame. Um, so for the creative projects, it's really the only thing that you'll be marked late on. If you don't do the creative projects on time, it, it takes a lot of time for me to grade those, about you know 10 minutes each. And over the summer, there's over 50. So there's a lot of 
grading many hours and in the fall and the spring I have like 200 of these to grade and there's two so those we kind of kind of want those in on time and I want them with your name on it if you call a, your file cp1 um, and then you know don't have your name inside or something it becomes very difficult so make sure you know you follow those directions um, for the creative projects you know we're going to have you you know write a simple melody and play it and you know whether that you know most of the time people just get a little phone app and go beep 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 beep, beep, beep um, and and record themselves doing that and that's how the recording um, and you you need no special skill we don't require you to write anything complicated we don't require you to write anything um, elaborate we don't require you to be uh, a young mozart we don't require um, anything beyond mostly playing the right notes. Um, so that's the performance piece. And everyone's always afraid of that. It's a very small portion of your actual creative project grade. Um, so, you know, for the creative projects, um, we understand that people are new at this. And even if you've played an instrument before, you're still new at this. And in some ways, if you've played an instrument before, you're at a disadvantage because there is a tendency to want to do something more elaborate and more complicated and, and come up with some grand composition. Uh, but grand compositions are hard to notate, they're hard to play, and they don't always follow the rules we ask you to follow. Um, so, you know, just do, do what feels naturally. Most people do very well on these and if they don't do well it's not because they weren't good musicians it's it's because they didn't follow the instructions you know so just if you don't understand an instruction ask ask me and i'll i'll go through them and we'll go through them before um before you have to do them um and you can send me drafts and i'll say no you want to fix this or fix that um but most people and when i mean they don't follow directions i mean they don't they don't include a score or their score um, is, you know, for di something completely different than what they're playing. So um, when I mean don't follow directions, I mean really, really, really don't follow the directions. So um, you will do fine on the creative projects um, and you will do fine on the exam. The exam will be, um, it is proctored. So some the, you have to put in the software um, configuration that's pretty, uh, standard. In fact, it's a Department of Education uh, requirement for online courses. Uh, so you'll be seeing it more and more often. It's to make sure that you are taking your the exam uh, that you're scheduled to take and that no one else is. Um, because uh, if other people, if it becomes routine for other people to take, um, routine for other people to take your uh, courses for you, your degree is worth all, uh, much less. So uh, this course has had some problems with that. Actually, it's the students have had problems because that we caught them. <laughs> um, so please don't don't do that. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, if you if your girlfriend's sitting right here on camera giving you the answers, we'll probably notice that. Um, I don't go looking for it, but the software will identify, oh, there's two people in the picture. Can you take a look? And I'll see a second person and the second person's, you know, doing it for you uh, that's that's sort of obvious so um you know don't don't do anything silly and you'll be fine <laughs> um so one thing to for those of you who are just tuning in again i'm dr wilcox so uh what i want to communicate in part of this is that i'm i'm here to help you i am here to make make it through sometimes this can seem a a daunting course a difficult course but it's not daunting it's not difficult um, it's, it's just, it's just a regular language type course. You're learning a language. And so there's going to be lots of small assignments that give you practice in drilling. Um, and that's really where this type of course shines. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a skills-based course. You're learning a new skill. The skill is music writing. And if you're not interested in learning music writing, well, maybe you'll become more interested yeah maybe i don't know or 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 maybe you won't but that that's fine regardless you'll get through so what is the best way before i actually talk about unit one stuff 
um, for those of you who are interested. And again, you can ask questions in the follow-up uh, discussion below this and I'll answer them live. Um, but what is the best way to do well in this course? You know, if, if you wanna know how to get an A, the best way is to set aside a certain amount of time daily, half an hour, hour maybe, and actually just spend a little time in the music class. Um, because there is class, right? Is this is online. That does not mean the entire course is homework or the entire course is, is optional. Um, the assignments are homework. The lessons are the class. So um, the first thing you wanna do is you wanna spend a little bit of time every day going to class, open up a lesson, read a tab or two, See if you can grab that and get that sorted in your head. And when you finish the lesson, you know, maybe over two sessions, they're not long, but you know, you, you can space it out how you want. Go ahead and try the homework assignment that's associated with that. And if you're having trouble with the homework assignment and you can kind of see, see the kind of things you're getting wrong, go back and review the lesson. See if there's something you missed something that you want clarification on. And I guarantee you, even if you're a music uh, aficionado, an expert, there'll be things in every single lesson that you haven't seen before that will be a uh, new bit of knowledge. Um, and even as I was writing the course, I noticed new things about music that I hadn't thought of in, in, in uh, the way that they're described. Um, so go ahead and spend a little bit of time in the lesson. Because if you try the homework and you never look at the lessons, you're skipping class. You're skipping class all week. You're trying the homework and you go, oh, I didn't do very well. I'm gonna redo the homework. And then I'm gonna redo the homework. And then I'm gonna redo the homework. So I've seen people who, who said, this doesn't make any sense. I'm not getting it. And I look and they've done the homework assignment like six or seven times. They've spent literally hours doing the homework but they've spent no time in the lesson. So they skipped class all week. They've come in, they do the homework assignment. They don't get it, they keep trying. And then they complain that it doesn't make sense. But it's because you didn't go to class. So go to class, read the lesson, do the homework. Read the lesson, do the homework. And do a little every day. Now this is good, not just for music class, but this is good for your growth as scholars or your growth as people. This is something that has been shown to be effective almost in any realm of, of uh, learning. It's called, you know, it's called a interspaced or interspersed practice. And essentially what that means is uh, you will learn more if you spend an hour a day on something um, maybe spend four or five days learning something, you'll, you'll learn more than spending one long period of eight hours doing something. So for instance, if you spend a little bit of time on this course every day, you're going to learn more than spending a comparable amount of time on one day. So if you wait till the last minute before the units do, and then you do eight hours you, even if you spent the same amount of time as, as you spent daily, you will remember far, far less. And then the same way you just kind of get bored when you're listening to someone or watching a lecture or you know, on a TV show, your mind starts to wander. The same thing happens you know, if you spend large amounts of time. So studies have shown that if you space your practice out, mix it up with other types of activity, maybe other classes, other type of learning, you'll do better and you'll do a lot better. And in this first unit, your main goal is to learn treble and blaze clef, learn to identify notes quickly. Because in unit three, unit four, unit five, unit six, you're gonna to need to use your skills reading notes. You're gonna to need to turn those notes into scales and you're gonna to need to, to look at intervals, the space between notes, and then you're gonna do triads and then you're gonna do um, triadic functions. You know, and if you still in unit five or unit six, if you're still going, oh, here's my G line, I'm gonna count up O, A, B, C. If you're still doing very basic kind of um, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, O, P. If you're doing that, the musical equivalent of that 
uh, in later units, the homework is going to get harder and harder. And it's going to get harder and harder because you didn't take the time to really cement your knowledge on that basic component. So spend some time, make sure you get your treble and bass clef learned, uh, and you'll do fine overall. Also, uh, another thing that science says really helps cement learning is sleep. So make sure you sleep. Uh, a lot of times, if you're learning something very difficult, taking a nap afterwards actually does a, a fair amount to make that knowledge stick because it, 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 your, your brain actually does a, a fair amount of rehearsing of the knowledge you've learned uh, while you sleep. So if you, different type part, periods of your sleep will actually, um, one period will help you cement process learning, one period will help you uh, like how to pitch a, pitch a ball, and one, one is help you remember uh, what's called epistotic learning, which is like, uh, you know, this happened then. So, so like learning how to read notes or something like that. Um, so get some sleep regularly, spend a little bit of time on it every day, and you'll do fine because it's not hard. And if you have questions, if it seems hard, just ask me, it'll be good. Um, Cause I'm totally willing to be there. Now you may have noticed that it is very bright where I am and that's because I am in California <laughs> and the sun has not gone down yet. So uh, I will not be meeting you at my office hours. And in this time of uh, no haircuts <laughs> and uh, questionable shaving, and spending too much time in our, in our bedrooms, in our offices, uh, instead of uh, out and about. Um, I probably wouldn't be meeting with you anyway, but that being said, I am still available. And if you have questions, the best thing to do is take a screenshot because every quest, everybody's random. So when you get questions on an assignment that you don't get, it's gonna be random, right? And one other thing about assignments, some assignments, we tell you right at the beginning, big and red, we will not give you the answer for, the, for these assignments. And that's generally because there's the, the questions were difficult to create and there's not a massive question bank. So you will get the same questions over and over again. If we just gave you the answers the first time, you could just fill them in. So for instance, the CORD project at the end, it's a, it's a five five percent It's just a large homework assignment. We don't give you the answers for that because you could turn in a single answer and then you know walk out and and just fill in the answers if we gave them so um i think that's understandable and that's just the way it is okay so let's talk a little bit about unit one and remember you can ask questions in the form so i'll just reload here and see if we have any questions and i've been reading through your introductions always nice to see uh, we have quite a few people who are who are studying music uh, for the fall, who are gonna be um, freshmen, you know, music people. So it's always good to see. Uh, you know, I, you know, was a tuba player for my undergraduate degree before I started composing. And I was not a bad player. And I was, I was a fairly reasonably accomplished high school student, but I'll tell you, I didn't know some of the stuff in unit one. I didn't know half the stuff in unit two. And by unit three, I could play scales, but I didn't know how they were made. And I didn't know the difference between them and how the different, how the different notes uh, you know, were standardized and directly reflected um, the, you know, the, the notes and spaces between notes. So there's a lot to learn no matter how skilled you are. So, so pay attention. So let me see, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm just gonna go through some of the basic stuff. Um, basic stuff of unit one. I'm not gonna get too complicated. Okay, so hopefully you can, you can all see this. This is, this is my iPad. And I thought this might be a good way to introduce some of the things. Um, now, the first thing I wanna talk about is, is musical sounds and non-musical sounds. So I'm just gonna, just for the sake of Drawing, um, drawing a difference. This is a uh, treble clef, you know, the treble clef, and this is the bass clef. Um, and when I have a musical sound, I'll be able to put a specific note down on the piano or, or on, the, on the staff. Um, and the reason I'll be able to put a specific note down is because I'll be able to sing it. 
So even with my fan, it still makes an, it's, it's a musical sound because it's, it's a steady sound that I can repeat back. But slapping the table here, I can't sing that. That is a non-musical sound because it does not produce a pitch. It does not produce a steady pitch. Um, and that's, uh, my pencil's not working here. Let's see. And uh, in, in, in music notation, we'd, we'd put non-musical um, pitches as with, with what, you know, this percussion clef. And this just indicates that the sounds being made, and maybe I'll use different note heads um, to indicate different percussion instruments. You know, the sounds being made are, are non-pitched. There's no pitch associated with them. So when, if you do the optional discussion and you say, well, here is an example of rain and that's a non-musical sound. Well, what I wanna hear is an example of rain used in a piece of music, right? Not just an example of rain. And if you use, if you want a, a, a musical sound in a non-musical context, well, you'd want something like the fan. It's not within a piece of music, but it's still making a musical sound, if that makes sense. So let's move on from there and talk a little bit about uh, steps and leaps. Okay, so a step uh, is on a staff is just anything adjacent. So this would be a step up, ascending step, and this would be a descending step. And steps are, there's not a lot of steps, right? Um, and it doesn't matter if it's an act, what the accidental stay. We're looking at just, is it on a neighboring line? Uh, is it on a neighboring space? So that's, that's how steps work. Um, and the reason I say that there's not many steps is everything else is a leap. Um, and steps and leaps generally come from scales. Um, when you're making a scale, scale comes from the word uh, ladder. Essentially, uh, the word we use for scales, I can't remember if it's Latin or is it Greek, comes from the Latin or Greek word for, for ladder. So when we, when we climb a scale, you're thinking I'm going step by step by step by step. Um, and what happens when you climb a set of stairs or climb a ladder and you accidentally skip a rung? Well, it's not pleasant, right? You fall pretty quickly. So anything that is not a step, anything that's not directly adjacent is a leap. So this would be a leap. This would be a leap, leap, leap. How about this? How about from this, these two notes? That would also be a leap. This would be a descending leap because it's going down. And this would be an ascending leap because it's going up. How about a trickier one? So hopefully this is all clear. You wanna think of that ladder, that, that steps where if you skip one, uh, you fall on your butt and uh, you feel silly. Uh, and you know, and that, that would be a leap. In order to go up on a ladder, you'd have to leap to get to, to skip a rung with your feet. That would, that would be awful. Um, and that's, that's sort of how it is. And the thing is, the reason it's like that is, is in music, if you move in a melody, um, between two pitches, you actually have the potential of creating another line of music. So if, let me just see if I can, let me see if you can hear this. Steps are very close. But if I move, um, so if I start on maybe this G, and I'll make a bass clef and I'll just start a G and I go up to A. That would be a step, but if I go from G up to B, there's actually a disconnect in the melody that happens. 
And the disconnect allows me to create two different lines. But if I'm just doing steps, your ear continues to track a single musical line. So I know that's, that was probably more detailed than you need, but that's the reason that only, only adjacent notes are considered steps and accidentals are completely immaterial um, to this. So even if you had those of you who are, who are a little more familiar, even if you had something like an E flat and an F sharp, it would still be considered a step uh, in music theory because it is an adjacent uh, line in space. Okay, so that is steps and leaps. And now let's look at, hopefully everyone is, oh, here's, am I getting a question here? No, hopefully everyone is pretty clear on the, the musical letters. The really the, the big thing is that they repeat. And each individual type of notes is called a pitch class. So I could have a pitch class and they would be A's. So this, all of these, these would all be A's. Um, and we'll, again, I'll, I'll talk, talk about the class in a second, but these would all be of the same pitch class, but this is an individual pitch. Um, okay. But the, the important thing is that is they repeat. And the reason we don't keep using more letters is your ear hears that eighth pitch, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, as the same as the first pitch. So tell me when I hit the eighth pitch. Can you hear how those kind of gel? Listen, every, there's a bite. Even though this one sounds, sounds good together, you can still hear two. See how that, if I play them at the same time, it almost sounds like one pitch. And so universally, this is the way human ears work. No matter what culture, no matter what time, they hear that pitch, what's called an octave, as the same note. They hear it as a return. So we also return by repeating our musical letters. So that's our musical letters. Let's look at some clefs. The first is treble and treble tells us where this G line is. And it's a very specific line. Let's, let's, let's do, let's do blue. Let's just be consistent. Treble tells us where the G over middle C is. Middle C is generally the C that's at the approximately, a little skewed to the right, but approximately the middle of the piano. Um, in, in, the, in the lessons I've marked it all, always in green, and I've marked the G in, in blue. And every, you see how the G, count, there's uh, two groups of black and then three groups of black, two and three, two and three. Um, what happens is every time you follow in the same same spot within within this this group, you get the same note. So this green C C before the the two uh, the two black keys is, is this 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 key here would also be a C before the two black keys, and so would this one. And would this one be? Yeah, it's before the two black keys. So this one and this one, these would all be Cs. Um, these would all be Ds, uh, et cetera. It's, it's, it's uh, consistent and if it, uh, visually. And if it wasn't, you'd have a really, really hard time of playing anything. It would be like playing on a zebra. It would be impossible to actually play the piano. Um, so 
we're going to concentrate on G above middle C. Um, so five notes are five keys. And the way we count it is one, two, three, four, five. Uh, we'll, we'll learn more about this in intervals, intervals. But if we look down here at our treble clef, we have our, our G line. This is where our G is. So if we have a note head, G, F, E, D, C. You notice how I don't have a ledger line underneath the D here? Don't need it. That's, that would be wrong. And I guarantee I'll see a million of those. Um, when I go down, I'll see like a B with a line down here. Uh, that's, that's just, I will see that. <laughs> um, so don't do that. Uh, G, F, E, D, C. So if you've got that G kind of identified, then you can just count up and down your musical letters. And at first it might be helpful to just you know write them down so that you can move back and forth. So if I start on G again, remember it's on my G line, and most you know treble clefs that aren't written like like a like a four year old with a crayon, um, the G line will kind of be wrapped around by the treble clef. So if I go G, I can go up to A. What would this be? G A. Well, B C D. So those are just the, the white notes. So I've, right now I'm just dealing with, um, just dealing with the, the white notes. So what if I was to play that, I would start here on the G, go down to the C, start on the G again and go up to the D, oh, up to the D. Not the most attractive thing, but yeah, I could do it like this. And I'll just resolve that down to a C. So there we go. There's my, my white keys on treble clef. Now let's just say that I wanted to make it a little bit maybe sinister. So instead of I could do So what did I do? Well, I started with my G and then an F, but instead of an E natural, I played an E flat. So right here, instead of, let's get rid of some of this detritus here. Instead of the, instead of an E, I played an E, e flat. So how did I do that? Well, this is called a semitone. It's a different, distance between any two adjacent keys, right? So from this key to this key, from this key to this one, this one to this one, this one to this one, these are semitones. So if I have my E here, what I would do is if I wanted to lower it by one semitone from an E, I would put a flat symbol. And see the flat symbol, it's right in front of the note head um, and it's right before the note. And that lowers the pitch by an adjacent key. So I got lowered it from an E down to a, an E flat. And similarly, if you heard what I played, I took uh, I took the the A and I made an A flat, and I took the B and I made a B flat. So A flat, B flat. So that's if I wanna lower. What happens if I wanna raise it? So for instance, I have, I have a C here. What happens if I take the C and I make it a C sharp? Well, what a sharp does is it, is it uh, raises by a semitone. So instead of taking it an adjacent key down, it takes it an adjacent key up. So for the C, I would go for C sharp right there. 
And if I wanted to cancel that out, because if you're within what are called bars, and we'll learn more about those in unit two, but I'll just put random bar lines in, that C sharp will continue to, to affect this note, this C. So this would also be a C sharp. And if I didn't want that, then I would use a natural sign. Natural signs are only there to cancel out an accidental. You never put a natural sign just on a note. This is a C, this is a G. This is a C natural and it's a C natural because it has a natural sign. I do not want to see natural signs other places. So what would this C sharp do? We had a, if I start, yeah, I'll just do the whole thing. This is a C, but instead I'm gonna go. So that's semi to, uh, sharps raise uh, flat lower by a semitone and a semitone's just uh, adjacent keys on the piano. And the piano is symmetrical. Um, so within each octave of a piano, um, the notes repeat, the note names repeat. Or the, so we're gonna have multiple Cs, multiple Ds, multiple Es. So let's look at bass clef, and bass clef tells you the what the the F below middle C. So if if treble clef is five notes above middle C, one two three four five, this is five notes below one two three four five, right? And again, we'll talk more about that um, later. So if this is an F, I can do the same sort of countdown E. D, C, B, and any of these could have sharps or flats on them. A, G, F, E. And really, you don't really need to know anything below the D very much, not very consistently. Uh, you can count if you have that. D, E, F, G, A, B, middle C. Um, so this C here in treble clef is the same as this C in bass clef. They're both middle C. Here you see I counted down five, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, two, three, four, five. And here uh, from the F line right there, I counted uh, one, two, three, four, five. Both of those are middle C. Um, so in one of the lessons, we point out really how close those clefs are to one another. So really, all you're doing is identifying um, the G line in bass clef, or the G line in treble clef, um, which is the second line from the bottom, and the F line in bass clef, second line from the top. And if you do that, you will be set. Now, when I was a kid, I also learned that every good boy does fine, it's a little sexist, but, um, and, and then F, A, C, E. So here's my spaces and my uh, lines and spaces. Um, and it's just a quick way to remember. Um, you'll see both of these are Fs, that's because they're an octave apart. And then in bass clef, let's see. Good boys do fine always. Again, you know, I grew up in the, in the 70s. <laughs> That's all I can say. There's probably better ones now. And then A, C, E, G. All cows eat grass. And I wish that were true, but it's probably not. And again, there's an octave there. Um, so, these are your treble and bass. And remember the second line is your F line and the second line here is your G line. Um, and in both of these, that ledger line below is this middle C uh, and the ledger line above middle C, exactly the same note. They're actually very quick. And the reason there's this big space between them because really you could have a single line between treble and bass clef 
um, for the C and, and, and then you wouldn't have to have any breaks, but this visually break is important. It helps you say, okay, one is one, the right hand on a piano, one is the left hand on the piano. It helps you break all of that up. And your semitones take you with a sharp is up a semitone and flat is down a semitone. Now I did wanna say a word about enharmonics. People get confused. Um, but enharmonics are really important. And when you start to do chords and when you start to do scales, you'll say, well, why is that note there? Well, when you do a scale, you have to have one of each letter. So this is, an, this is a C major scale. And you see, I have one of each letter, C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And even if I sharp everyone, I'm making a, a C sharp major scale, which we'll learn about in unit three, this is still one of, of every letter, right? I don't have any additional letters. Now you'll notice that this, this last note is a B sharp. And B sharps are one of those ones that bother people because a B sharp can be played on, is played on the C key, right? It's a B, with a sharp up a semitone. So it's played here, but why not just write C? Well, because we have C sharps. And if, if you wrote, instead of this B sharp, if you wrote a C natural, well, then you'd have a C sharp and a C natural in the same scale and you have two of the same letters. Um, besides the fact that it's very confusing, these sharps, um, you know, like a, the other one that's very common is like an E sharp. So an E played on the F key or an F flat, an F played on the E key. Um, these, this spot, these two spots um, always create the, the most confusion between uh, B and C. The zero trouble areas and between E and F, um, those are the places where there's no black key between the white keys. And thank God, because again, the piano would be impossible to play if there was a black key there. Um, but it's those places um, that create a lot of the, the confusion uh, with enharmonics and with scales, because these areas um, where there's adjacent notes within, like for instance, the white keys, they'll, they'll travel and we'll see how they'll move around those, those semitone spaces within scales. Cause we can take a scale from these white keys all the way from this C up to, up to this C. We've got, a, we've got a scale, but there's these semitones um, as opposed to the whole tones, which are two semitones, one, two, that would be a whole tone. So these places between E and F and B and C always give people trouble. So if you're having trouble saying, why are these, why am I, why am I getting this noted, written wrong? It's, you look and you'll see that half the time it's because there's that B and C and, and, and F and E and you're, you're you know, putting it on the wrong key or you're playing it on the wrong key of the piano or you know, um, because, because you're not taking into account that, that, that half step between E and F and B and C. Okay, so on the piano identification homeworks, I did not want to, I can't remember, I think it's 44. I did not want to label every single key on the piano. So if I give you something like this and I, and I ask you what key on the piano is, count 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, and put 51 in the blank. So just use the numbers I give you to count with. That's how that homework assignment works. I won't belabor that. If anybody has questions about any of this, they think, oh, I could have gone into more detail. Yes, probably. Um, so go ahead and ask them either in the forum or ask them uh, you know, afterwards or send me an email, a screenshot. Um, the nice thing about putting them in the forum is everybody else gets to read it. So. Um, you know, that's, that's a socially beneficial thing to do. Um, let's look at uh, these. When you have notes on a more extreme end of the keyboard, really 
unless you're a flute player, um, most people start to get a little vague about ledger lines. It starts to become hard to quickly count them about there. I mean, I can easily see that's a D and an F, e and an F but it starts to get kind of fuzzy. Uh, the same thing would be true in bass clef. Uh, let's see, here's an E, D, C, B. Um, actually, um, this, this little image I have here is, is running out and it's not, let, it, it won't let me write below that, but that's, that would be an A. It gets a little, um, a little squishy below that. So, um, you know, it's because, you know, we have trouble, you know, trouble with uh, lots and lots of lines. Um, so what happens if we want to write below that? Because um, if I was to play this top thing, let me, let me get over here on the piano. That's great, but what, what happens if I want to play the octave higher, the G's an octave higher? Well, I don't want to have, you know, 15 ledger lines. So what I would do for anything higher than this is I would write eight VA. And this just means an octave higher, like that. So when I give you the eight VA symbol, that means to play the notes that are underneath it up an octave. Similarly, if I wanted to, if I played the bottom notes, let's see. If I wanted to play, again, I, I don't want to have 15 ledger lines, so I put octave bass. And I, I don't know if you can see that where the, the edge of the image is, it's right there. So I'm, I, what I, I'm going to put that, I would write octave bass. And, you know, I put, put it down like that. So that just means you play something down an octave. Now you generally don't do this inside the staff. So I would not do this. I would not do this to, to mean this. This is awkward. And if the, the problem, what you're trying to do, it's like you're trying to, you have, it's like, I have to write something out to have someone read it aloud in class, right? And so if you write something that's weird, or your you know verb tenses don't match, or you, your you know your dangling participles, it stops people from reading fluidly. So what you're doing here is you're writing things for for musicians to play to reproduce the notes. So if you write something like this where people don't see, which is you know eight VA within a staff or octave down within a staff, um, you actually create a lot of confusion for people. Um, it's not something they typically typically see. So even though you can interpret this up an octave or down an octave, people will immediately stop. And when they stop, you have a problem. Um, you're, that means you, you, you broke a rule. And just like you're breaking a rule in English, you're writing something that's kind of grammatically weird. Um, you know, uh, the same thing is true with music. You're gonna create a slowdown, but in music, something that happens in time, if you if you create a slowdown, um, it's a real problem. Another thing that I'll show you here, um, just if I wrote something like this, this, 15 MA, this is two octaves higher. Now, why isn't it, why isn't it uh, 16, eight and eight? Well, let's count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, oh, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. I went from G to G, fifteen. Um, and the thing is, your instinct for sixteen is because you would have to double count that G twice. So G, the G going to G and the G going to G again, you don't double count that. So 15 MA or 15 B, uh, you know, uh, 
I think it's BS actually, 15 um, below, um, it just means do, uh, an, an octave higher. So instead of this, let's see, it's this. All right, so that's, that's how that works. And one last thing, that last homework assignment, and we teach some of these things because it's part of the core curriculum. We have to, we have to hit it. Um, and some of it's to prepare those of you who um, will go farther with this. Uh, when you write about music, um, you can say, well, if you wanna write you know, about Cs, it could be any C. But if I'm writing something and I wanna talk about this C right here, this one, I'd put C4, right? Or middle C. But say I wanted this specific, I wanted to say this pitch was important. I wanted to write this in my paragraph. Well, this is C5. Um, so, and that actually, it, it makes a difference. So all Cs pitch class, but this is a specific C, um, a specific pitch. Um, so C4, C5, and C is generally a good way to remember it. And everything within this area keeps the number. So for instance, this C4, this B4. If this is C4, this is B3. How about this? What would this be? Well, it's B sharp, B sharp what? B sharp, it's B sharp four. And it doesn't matter that it's played on the same key as C5 because we're not talking about how it's performed. We're talking about how it works in music theory. Um, and just in the same way as steps and leaps, you know, are adjacent on the staff. And when you make scales, there'll be, you know, adjacent on the staff. Um, anything, anything that this B right there, that B doesn't matter if it has a sharp, flats, double sharps, double flats, double sharp, sharp would be like that. Let me just put that up because I didn't mention that. B, B sharp would be played on the C key. B double, if you, if you actually see them, they have the little, little feet, see. B double sharp, that'd be played on the C sharp key. Um, but that would still be, B, you know, B double sharp would still be four <laughs> because it falls within that. And it, until we get to C's of some stripe, even, how about this? What would this be? That would be a C flat five, right? It's not a four because we're past B's, we're into C's. Um, so when you're working through the octava signs, you just want to remember, pay special attention to Bs and Cs where it changes numbers over. And it doesn't matter what the enharmonic equivalent is or the fact that you're playing it on a C key or a C sharp key, or if you're playing a C on a B key or um, a double flat, which really lowers it to semitones. Uh, this is still a C double flat five, okay? Also make sure, you know, I think in the, in the homework, we, we indicate how we want you to write those. Uh, and that's because, you know, this is a computer, you know, and a uh, computer um, graded assignment and we cannot, you know, grade all the many, many little assignments. Um, so we tell you the way we, the computer will recognize a correct or incorrect answer. So if you have questions about that, just let me know. Okay. So I realize that by now most people are long gone, that no one will ever see this wrap up. But um, as I said, most important thing is to learn to read treble and blaze class. And I would learn, you know, dead cold, middle C to the A above the staff. And in bass class, I'd learn E below the staff, which is visually the same as middle C to middle C above the staff. I just learned those cold, all the sharps, all the flats and be able to go like this be with just, because if you do, when it comes time to making scales, when it comes time to making chords, 
you're not going to have any problems. But if you're still counting A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay, it's a G. You're going to, it's going to slow you down. There's more things happening in what's called your working memory that you have to hold in place while you're kind of shifting. Oh, I need to put this note up an octave to make this type of triad. And you're going to give yourself a lot more um, problems. So take some time, uh, memorize your treble and bass clef notes and contact me. Let me know how it's going. Let me know if you have trouble. I'll be looking through your entry exams to see who might need a little extra uh, help or who might be a master and need some extra uh, fun stuff to play with. Um, let me know. Um, and I'm here again, Dr. Wilcox, uh, your summer instructor for music theory. And let me know how I can help. Okay, bye-bye.